everyone. Welcome to episode 10 of the Data Driven Strength Podcast. Uh, today we're going to be doing another Q&A. Got some questions lined up for you all. We uh, just took about five minutes of getting the character off air here, so we're feeling good, ready to provide some insightful answers, or at least we think so. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into it. Um, the first question, I will pose this to Mr. Josh over here. Uh, Josh, could you expand on exercise variations contribution to strength? For example, you guys are a fan of snatch grip stiff like deadlifts for hamstring hypertrophy. How much do you think this contributes to strength as far as neurological adaptations? Yeah, so we we certainly um, you know are use a good amount of exercise variation, especially for our hypertrophy focused slots. So something like a snatch grip stiff like deadlift. Um, depending on the individual and their leverages can certainly be a really good way to put the hip extensors through a longer range of motion um, and really kind of bias the tension in a way that that maximizes the hypertrophy stimulus on the hip extensors, right? Primarily the glutes and the hamstrings. But then the, the, the later part of this question asks, how much do you think it contributes to strength as far as neurological adaptations? And my answer to that is, is probably not a whole lot. And I would, I would follow that up and just say, when you're programming each set, pick a, a primary goal and kind of optimize for that primary goal. So if you're, if you're trying to accumulate training volume um, and, and, and you're doing so because you're trying to maximize the hypertrophy stimulus, optimize for maximizing the hypertrophy stimulus. Um, so I think people can get into a weird middle ground in which they're, they're grinding through, um, you know, low bar squats, or they're grinding through deadlifts in like this, you know, maybe three to five rep range at like RP eight to 10, in which, you know, there's a, they're piling on a ton of fatigue. They're limiting their capacity to accumulate sufficient training volume, but they're, they're really not getting a good tension stimulus. They're not getting a good hypertrophy stimulus on the prime movers. Of, of the lift. So, you know, you, you, that's why we like to, okay, we, we, we did a, a, a high intensity exposure on the main lift. Maybe we did a couple, um, you know, volume sets um, on the main lift to get some more practice and, and is also accumulate some hypertrophy. But once we kind of check our boxes there, we can move that individual onto an exercise like a snatch grip stiff leg deadlift in order to maximize the rate of hypertrophy for the target muscles. And when I do that, I'm not thinking of neurological adaptations. I'm not thinking about strength skill. I'm thinking about growing the prime movers. So the answer to this question is, I'm sure it contributes a little bit, right? Like having a good um, hip hinge motor pattern is, is going to be beneficial. And like, I'm sure there's, there's to some degree, there are neuro neurological adaptations um, that are going to be of benefit, but that's not what I'm thinking about. That's not what I'm optimizing for. And the biggest bang for your buck in terms of neurological adaptations are going to be your peak intensity exposures. You know, your, your top single, double, triple in the RP five to nine range. Um, so again, I, I think the point here is, is there's always going to be overlap, right? You're, you're always, you're going to get hypertrophy from a single, um, but you're not programming the single with hypertrophy in mind. You're thinking you're, you're programming the single with strength skill in mind use that same logic on your hypertrophy work for the hypertrophy work program with hypertrophy in mind. If you get a little bit of extra strength skill out of it, awesome, but don't get in some weird middle ground where you're not getting good strength practice. And you're also not getting a good tension stimulus on the prime movers. Um, so that would kind of be my answer is keep the goal of the set, the goal optimize for that goal and, and don't get caught in a weird middle ground. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that's by far the most, uh, beneficial way to think about things and gives you really, really practical advice. I think um, if we're to speculate a little bit, we have an article on our website talking about movement variability. I think, you know, by providing exercise variation and to some degree, it, it's not really a specific exercise variation per se, but just variation itself um, could provide some, um, you know, motor learning benefits that are kind of in the realm of neurological adaptations for strength. So I think that's something that you could potentially speculate as far as, you know, including some variations that are going to generally be our hypertrophy work um, will also help with that. So um, yeah, I don't have too much to add other than that. I think maybe one other thing we can throw in here as far as, is it 
neurological neurological adaptations in, in the way that we generally think about it, maybe not. But another way that these variations can contribute to strength down the line, similar to what Josh was saying about hypertrophy, would be if we're using a variation to target a certain element of your technique that could be improved. That, for example, a pin squat or a pin bench or something that using like keeping the goal of that set is still to improve that portion of your technique but down the line that transfers to the main lift all of a sudden you have higher skill for that lift you can express your strength better so i think that that is it's it's just another way that these variations we still want to make sure that we're really intentional with what we choose and how we execute it um like you're saying keep the goal the goal for that right if, if it's a hypertrophy thing we're maximizing tension and, and all that stuff that Josh talked about. But if we could have another goal too, right? I guess that's what I'm trying to say. There, there can be multiple different things that we can do with this that still ultimately will improve the thing that we care about the most. Yeah, there, there's certainly overlap. Um, and I, I definitely agree with that. So like, for example, I'm not saying to just do your top set on the main lift and then that's your strength practice. And then you, you move on to your hypertrophy work it probably makes some sense to accumulate some training volume on the main lift, even if it isn't a really good hypertrophy stimulus for the prime movers for that individual, because, um, you know, to accumulate some more practice and yes, by accumulating that training volume, it is going to be hypertrophy work as well. So there definitely is overlap there, but, you know, perhaps the, the biggest take home is if, if you're going to program for hypertrophy, you know, kind of hang out in that six to 15 rep range, probably makes sense to to put the other goals aside so like if you are going to program a tempo squat or a, a pin squat because you think it's going to be helpful for that individual's technique the way that i would i would implement that into a program so maybe on their secondary squat day uh you know for their top set they do a a, a tempo squat followed by one or two back offsets on the tempo squat and then assuming it's it, it's within the the how i want their program to be set up in that day as well, I'd go put them into a hypertrophy mo focus movement after that. So I definitely agree they overlap, but I think it's especially the case that if you're going to do something like a snatch grip, stiff leg deadlift, you're probably setting things up to optimize for hypertrophy. So, so don't get caught up in that. The only other thing I'll say is, is when we say neurological adaptations, I think what people are like, kind of what they mean is like strength skill. Um, generally, that's like the common translation of that. I think it's often downplayed um, how much muscle size contributes to that too. Um, and obviously that's our bias. We talk about hypertrophy all the time and how that matters for strength. So that's probably no surprise to hear us say that. But what I mean is when you have a movement, let's say a heavy competition squat and your knees are starting to come back and, and that makes your technique feel weird. If you get your quads bigger, that's going to expand what I've called a couple of times, like kind of your movement library of the, the technic, technical uh, ways you can execute that squat of the given load. So I think, uh, again, keeping the, the, the goal of the set, the goal um, is definitely the best way to think about it. And then just realize that by doing this, you're going to have a ton of other benefits. So it's just part of a solid strength program overall to have um, hypertrophy movements that are focused on that. And those will come for benefits um, for strength and strength skill, uh, maybe just not in like the direct you know, neuromuscular adaptations that you would from like a one RM. So I just think it's just part of a well-rounded strength program that, um, you know, just maybe has a different avenue to improve it. Yeah, that's, that's a point. Um, and when I've programmed, uh, you know, kind of really quad focused um, hypertrophy work and an individual accumulates a few training blocks with that in their program, they're like, man, I feel a lot more comfortable actually like using my quads in the main lift. So that's a very, very good point. Is that and that's even done. when it's on like a leg press or like something that's right. relatively like not specific, it's not in just high bar squats. What he's, what Josh is right. saying. It's like, even if you're doing something on a relatively non-specific movement, increasing the muscles that allow you to explore those movement strategies, um, will, will, yeah, will just give you a ton more options. 100%. All right, cool. We'll wrap that one up and I will throw, the next question to you, Zach. Um, so the question is, would you program more volume during a hypertrophy block or would you just change the distribution of volume with regard to rep range? So, yeah, this is a really good question um, and kind of dives deep into like traditional periodization versus kind of what we like to do. Um, 
So in traditional periodization, kind of where I think this question is inspired from, volume kind of decreases throughout the training cycle. So in like a hypertrophy focused block, you're going to be performing the most total training volume, whether you uh, quantify that by hard sets, total repetitions, volume load, whichever your preferred metric of volume is, that would be the highest. Our preference, and in, 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 uh, excuse me, in the traditional periodization model, as you get closer to a strength test, that's just going to gradually decrease the entire time. Um, and our preference, on the other hand, is to kind of set things up in a way that allows us to maintain uh, training volume kind of out throughout the entire cycle. Um, but what we do is kind of shift the bias and in, in where this training volume is coming from. So that can come in a, in a, in a few different ways. So this, this question asked uh, in repetition range, which might be one way that we do things, um, but that's also going to come from the proximity to failure of which the sets are performed. And then even potentially the ratio of volume allocation that we might uh, perform on hypertrophy focused movements versus competition uh, specific movements. So for example, in a hypertrophy phase for us, you may be performing on average, higher tep higher repetition work on average sets that are closer to failure and on average, a little bit more hypertrophy work than at the end of the cycle where you may be performing kind of the opposite of all those, maybe a little bit more competition specific work sets farther from failure and slightly lower rep repetition ranges. But the overall principle is that volume is going to stay relatively the same, depending on how you define that. I think in our periodization model, probably the best way to define that is what's called relative volume, which is going to be percentage of 1RM times repetitions times sets. And that's going to stay pretty much the exact same throughout the entire training, uh, training cycle, despite, I mean, with the exception of intros and deloads and that kind of thing. Um, but overall, it's going to stay the same if you kind of take a bird's eye view from the training cycle. And it really, it is just that shift in bias um, in the hypertrophy block. We're kind of going to turn the dial of all those variables to uh, uh, kind of optimize things for muscle size. Um, and that may come at a slight cost to muscle strength, but we ultimately think that's going to be a good long-term investment. And then once we get to the strength phase, we'd kind of bias all those things in the strength direction, which will optimize things um, to express that strength and muscle size that we gained in the first block in the short to moderate term. And that's really kind of how we do it. Um, we think keeping volume around is probably a good idea for a number of reasons. Um, the first is simply to have a um, stimulus for muscle size, essentially year round. Um, now, volume is definitely, you know, based on the literature is probably the primary driver of hypertrophy. Um, and, and so our, with our kind of way of thinking that muscle size is the long term limiter of strength, we probably want to continually chip away at, at building muscle essentially as much as we can. Now, again, at the end of the training cycle, you might taper things like that deloads, that's going to decrease training volume. But for the vast majority of the time, we are trying to have a very solid stimulus for muscle growth to ultimately chip away at that long term limiter. Um, so that is, in, and, and then the second side of it would be to maintain, you know, some degree of the total repetitions you're performing on a given lift. So if I'm decreasing training volume a ton, that's going to come with a decrease in the amount of repetitions I'm practicing the lifts that I ultimately want to be good at. Um, that's just another uh, reason that, um, you know, you would want to keep volume around. Um, if I want to perform 20 repetitions per workout on a squat to feel really, really solid practice. If I strip that down to five at the end of a training cycle, that might be, um, you know, limiting how practiced I feel or vice versa, depending on when you do it. Um, and then finally, just having a large decrease in training volume is might have kind of a lag period after you finish a training cycle. So if you come off a meet in which you've decreased training volume a ton, that next couple blocks where you're kind of building things back up to try to get to um, kind of the workloads you were handling up to that meet might have kind of a long lag period where um, you just don't feel that training is super productive, um, which some people have some anecdotes to support that. So that those are kind of the three main reasons um, I think that we try to do things the way that we do and kind of the, the main thing when we provide. And then again, we view, view it purely as a shift in bias rather than um, having more or less volume in a given period of time, but go ahead, clean that up guys. That was a long ramble, um, adjust wherever I messed up or anything. Yeah, so just to, to jump in here and um, add, a, add a couple points or, or potential clarifications, definitely echo what, what Zach said. I, I just want to clarify a couple things to start. Um, so Zach said we, we think it's most appropriate within our model to quantify training volume using relative training volume, which like Zach said is percentage of 1RM times reps times sets. 
So again, just to make sure we're, cl we're crystal clear, the way that we will kind of think about, okay, throughout this training cycle, yes, we're going from a hypertrophy focus to a strength focus, but we're keeping relative volume the same, but we're decreasing uh, rep range and we're also decreasing proximity to failure. So how does that work out in practice? It's, it's actually quite simple. So just to give a, a basic example, say you were doing a set of eight at RP8, right? So a set of eight with your 10 rep max load in this, the hypertrophy phase, what we'll do in the strength phase is, is keep, uh, you know, for that set, keep load the same and just break it up into two sets of four. So again, that accomplishes everything. And since relative volume is percentage of one RM times total reps, right? Or times reps times sets, the relative volume is equated. Now we might bump the average intensity up a little bit. So it might go from a 10 RM load to an eight RM load, but that's not really the, the main point. The main point is that we can essentially break the work up into more sets um, in order to equate that relative volume. So I just want to make sure that was clear because most people th these days think of, of volume as set volume. And if you were to do that while, while checking all the other boxes we've said, um, that would lead to way lower relative volume. I'm not saying relative volume is, um, is perfect. And I'm also not saying set volume is, is bad. It just depends on the context of, of the system you use and the, the, the kind of training cycle periodization we advocate for is probably best to think about, um, you know, the, the volume changes or lack thereof using relative volume. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, is Zach said, okay, during certain phases, we will optimize for the rate of hypertrophy gains potentially at the slight cost of, of strength gains. Um, and I would just add one clarification there that it's at the, the a potential slight cost of the rate of the strength gain and not at strength gain in and of itself. So I, I definitely don't wanna see strength going down uh, considerably. I, I, we typically still see it trend upwards. It's just that, okay, we might, sac we might not optimize for the rate of strength gain. Um, you know, we still wanna see it go up, but we're, we're okay accepting a, a, a smaller rate of gain um, for that long-term hypertrophy investment. Um, so those are the first two things to clarify. And then the, the second thing, or um, excuse me, the third thing, um, Zach kind of went through some really good reasons about why we, we think it makes sense to keep um, training volume constant and not go f like work from a super high volume um, training block down to a super low training uh, volume and, and more or less keep it constant throughout a training cycle. So Zach said for um, the, the one, his first reason was to keep um, the hypertrophy stimulus high year round, since that is such an important investment for long-term strength. Awesome. I, I, I totally agree with that. That's probably one of the main reasons. The second is to keep the practice around of the lift, which I, I also totally agree. Um, and the, the, the one thing that I would add to that is, is it gives you extra diagnostic clarity by keeping the total training dose the same. So if we're going from a high volume paradigm to a low volume paradigm throughout a training cycle or over the course of a handful of months and, and things go poorly or if things go well, if, or if there was no response, it's really hard to tell what did or did not work. Whereas if we kind of say, okay, this is our training dose. Yes. The, the actual configuration of the training dose might shift a little bit, right. As we make some of those changes we've talked about by, by um, reducing average RPE, um, by, re by um, you know, doing more uh, lower rep sets, kind of breaking that work up into more sets. Yes, that's, that's, that, that does change things. But at the end of the day, by, by equating relative volume, we're keeping the overall dose constant throughout the training cycle because we would advocate that that is really what's driving the overall training response. And if you're, if you're changing that dose, within a training cycle, again, it's gonna be really hard to figure out what their dose is. Because again, as, as a coach, I view my job to find the, the, end of the, the right dose for each squat bench and deadlift for each lifter that I work with, right? Of course, you want to properly configure that dose as well, but at the end of the day, if the training dose is not in a good spot, the individual is not gonna be able to progress. So if, if you're changing the dose week to week or block to block, it's going to be really hard to have the diagnostic clarity um, to really individualize training over time. So Zach's answer was, was awesome, but hopefully that adds a little bit of color.
I have one thing that I just want to throw in there really quick. I agree with everything that you guys said. I think that was really, really well explained. Um, one thing that, I, that I'll say about the training dose is that we don't, we don't know what the optimal dose is for the individual. Meaning that at some point, if things are progressing really, really well, then awesome, right? Let's keep it either the same or very, very similar. There's gonna be times where we need to experiment with the dose, right? So I think that, and obviously there's a lot of factors that go into that, but one of them is volume. And if we decide based on XYZ reasons that we want to experiment with higher volume, that's probably best done during a hypertrophy block, right? So I think that's a situation where it could look like we're, it could be the case that we're doing this with more volume in the hypertrophy block, but the reasoning is different, right? It's not, we're training for hypertrophy, thus we need more volume. It's that we're experimenting with a higher dose. Let's try it throughout the entire training cycle, starting with the hypertrophy block, right? So I'm just, again, as we always talk about not taking things off the table, I think that's a reason where, where that could uh, happen. So I just wanted to throw that in there really quick. Yeah, not, that's actually what I was going to echo, Jake, but kind of in the opposite direction. I also don't want to take off the table of periods of lower volume. I think those can have definitely potential utility um, in some circumstances. I think when we have these conversations, generally the way we frame it is kind of our starting point. And this is kind of the training cycle that we're looking to optimize and individualize over time. And if somebody wants to, um, you know, prep for a meet in 12 to 16 weeks, this is what we're going to do. But sometimes we'll employ like a kind of transition block or a period of four weeks between cycles that has like a slightly different goal than, than to optimize the rate of progress in one of the adaptations we're concerned with, whether it be size or strength. So, you know, you could have, this is obviously speculative. We've talked about this a little bit. Maybe you have a block that, you know, you've been blasting high training volumes for a lift for a really long time. And either you want to take a break um, and, and just put that on maintenance for a little bit just for psychological reasons, or maybe you want to try your hand at some type of resensitization or something like that. I think there could be potential utilities to a, to a period of lower volume as well. And then also Josh has made multiple posts on uh, specialization cycles that kind of um, would be a lower volume for a given muscle group while you kind of turn another muscle group up. So I think while our starting point is definitely to maintain training volume, which is going to be relative to the individual, I do think there's circumstances in which you could probably argue for higher and lower volume, depending on the goal. But if we're talking our base starting point that we're going to have nearly all of our lifters kind of uh, operate from, it's going to be from a, a standpoint of maintaining volume in, in most cases. Yeah, those, those are all awesome points. Um, very, very well said, Zach, the, the kind of the caveats of, you know, potential ways to deviate from this, this repeating training cycle type model. And also Jake, I, I think that's an awesome, awesome point that you made about um, kind of experimenting. And, and I guess what I would add there and um, to perhaps make sure that I, I, I think this is an important point to keep in mind is that this is why we don't make training cycles year, uh, like a one year training cycle. Because if you keep the training cycle manageable right? It's, it has to check the box of a, it gives you enough time for the adaptations to actually occur, right? Yes, you can make really good progress in a training block. But okay, we have like five or six data points, like, how sure can we actually be so probably like we think it should probably be a little bit longer than that. But it also can't be so long that by the time we experiment a little bit, we've already been training for six years. And you're like, shoot, I haven't even individualized anything. So there's a middle ground there. So that's why it's like, okay, if we keep the training cycle in a manageable range, right, maybe 10 to 16 weeks on average, that kind of checks both of those boxes. And then you can say, okay, for my bench press, I'm going to bump up the training dose because I have this feedback from the athlete. I have some indication um, based on the pattern recognition over time as, as I've been coaching for X number of years. I, I think it makes sense to bump up the training dose for this lift. And then you let it play out and, and you're monitoring, but you're, you're also giving it time to play out. So if you keep the training cycle manageable enough, I think you can kind of have your cake and eat it too, because you can experiment. Um, and even once you do find something, you know, you do get them in, you do give them a formula that works. You can kind of experiment a little bit and see if that makes things better, right? Because it's not like there's just like some perfect dose that that's the only dose they progress with, right? It's probably a range. But you can ex once you get them progressing, you can experiment a little bit 
and, and kind of follow the response, right? Uh, if, if X worked, maybe Y works better. Maybe we keep going in that direction. So really awesome point points, guys. I don't know if I added anything valuable there, but um, if you guys have anything to add, hop in. If not, I'll, I'll throw the next question out. Cool. All right, this next question is for Jake. Um, if you had a short-term strength goal that you wanted to achieve as fast as possible, what would you do differently programming-wise, if anything? Um, they gave the potential options of higher RPEs, more volume, or, or maybe something else. This is a really good question. And it's something that a lot of people, I think, bring up. Um, and I think that I think of it quite simply in that we're going to do the best thing that we can do regardless, right? Like this, this would sort of assume that a normal strength block would be taking things slower than we need to or that we're not doing everything that we can to really get the most out of our training. So if we're already having an intelligent setup, we have a number of heavy exposures that we know this athlete progresses really well with, um, our relative volume is, is in the right spot, right? All of these things, we have all these things set up the way that we do because we think it's the best and because we think it's gonna get us that strength goal as soon as we can. So I think that that's really as simple as it needs to be a lot of times, as long as the things were planned appropriately to begin with, there's really no like special things that we need to change just because we want to rush, right? We just wanna really stay the course is really how I like to think of it. So I don't know if you guys have anything else to add. Um, I think that's that's really where I sit with it. I think the main thing is just how do you define short-term? Because I totally agree if short-term is in the course of a training block, we already are assembling a training block in the way that's going to, what we think is going to make the best progress. Um, you can't just rush to the, to the peak workloads of a block because that's going to come with inherent limitations. If you get injured, obviously now you're not strong anymore. Um, so you can't just rush to the peak workload that you think is going to be most successful. So I think it really comes down to what is short term, because if, if you're just telling me like, how do I get as strong as possible in 10 days? I think I might have a slightly different answer than, than short term meaning training block. I think from a practical perspective, I completely agree with what Jake said. Um, and I think the person asking this question is probably along that lines um, is like, if I have a strength goal in four to six weeks, what should I do? And I think we already designed training in a way that we think is going to optimize that in the short term. Um, now the slightly less applicable, but kind of fun and nerdy question is like, how does somebody optimize strength in, you know, seven to 10 days or something like that? If that's what we're counting as short term in which I think we would visit maybe something more, a little bit more akin to like taper ish training, which, you know, we talk a ton about how much muscle mass matters in the long term, Um, and, and so that's a part of the reason we keep training volume so high, potentially, if you're looking to optimize strength in like seven to 10 days maybe you slash a ton of that training volume out and you really try to maximize specificity and you kind of get into this Bulgarian ish looking, looking, uh, you know, training week. But as I said, if you just completely change what you're doing way too fast, you're probably not going to have super good results in, in that regard. And, and if you get hurt, then you're not strong anymore anyway. So I don't know. I, I was just throwing that out. I think it really comes down to what you're defining as short term. And if it's like, you know, I want to be super strong in four days. Like I, maybe that changes our answer a little bit, but from the practical perspective, if you're talking short-term, like a training block, I totally agree with what Jake said. Yeah. Not to, not to be a fun killer, but like, obviously this is a, a, a interesting theoretical question, but like, if any one of us had a lifter ask us this question, we'd be like, I like, we would basically find a way to talk them out of wanting Boo. to get yeah, I know, I know, I know. But if we would we would find a way to talk them out of this this mental framework of, you know, getting a short term strength goal as fast as possible, um, because I, that's just probably not the best way to think of it. But with that caveat, I just wanted to make that very clear because I do like this conversation. I think it's very interesting. Um, but I just wanted to make that caveat because I do think it's important to keep in mind. Um, we wouldn't advocate for just like pulling the trigger on okay arbitrarily choose let's uh get as strong as possible in 15 days for you to say that's bad josh that's what, that's what, what if i have a goal to max out with my friend at the gym in five days and that just happens to be my goal i'm not training for a meet i'm training for a bro expedition showdown at la fitness i'm actually all for that i actually had a client who um tests deadlift i think it's new year's eve every year and it was like week two of a strength block and i was like 
this is an awesome goal. I'm all for this. Like it's going to remove some diagnostic clarity from our training cycle, but this is awesome. Like I'm not going to stop you. So I'm, I'm a fun sucker, but not, not too much of a fun sucker. Um, <laughs> so with that out of the way, I definitely agree with what, what you guys said in terms of just kind of sticking to the principles of a strength phase. So like, um, it's going to be very individual dependent. Um, so for some individuals, if you, if you strip away training volume and, um, you know, just kind of the, the total number of repetitions of practice that they're accumulating, it's going to be, um, they're, they're not going to see a positive response, whereas others will really benefit from that reduction, um, in training volume. So like Zach for your bench press, if we were to say, okay, you have two weeks to get as strong as possible. And we stripped away a, t a ton of training volume you're probably not going to see a great response from that. Whereas me, I'm kind of on the other end of the spectrum. That might be the best way to go for myself. Mm -hmm. um, so with some indication from previous training data and working with somebody, you can make some, some guesses about that. Um, and the, the next thing I'd say is like how risky, how, how risky can you be with the approach you take to this? Um, so like, if you don't have a ton of training data, like what's your best guess? So like it's, it's tough because you say, okay, I want to maximize strength in two weeks. And, and I just kind of made the case why that's going to vary a good amount between individuals and even between lifts within an individual. Um, so, you know, I think it's important to keep in mind, like how risky can it be, right? Because if, if you're trying to maximize strength, you obviously want to have, you know, some degree of, of, you know, precision, in, in, in terms of the strength you're going to reach um, at the end of this, this, this phase that you're doing. So maybe you do keep relative volume the, the same, like we talked about in the, the last question. So basically it's hard to say if you have previous training data, you can, um, you can kind of go off of that a little bit, but let me know what you guys think about that. Yeah. I just, I just think everything Josh does is dumb and just max every day for seven days and, and see what, see what happens. But no, I, I think, I think that's a really good point. It's going to be extremely individual. Um, you know, there might be some things that are going to work on average, but it's not going to be super helpful on an individual level. Um, so yeah, in, in general, um, I would have to agree. I will be even more of a fun killer than Josh was just for a second that Josh mentioned that a lot of times if somebody comes with this mindset, we might try to discourage that. And I think that a, a different side of that same coin of like, I want to be as strong as possible in X number of days or weeks is I want to hit this number in this many weeks. And that is, I think that's definitely something that we discourage people from just because it's like, we're going to do the best we can. We're going to design it to get as strong as we can as you know what I mean? But it's like, just having coming in with that expectation can really set you up for disappointment because things happen sometimes, right? Like not everything is going to go perfectly. Um, so just to kind of suck all the fun out of this question, I will throw that in. What a letdown. Yeah. You know, that's, that's what we do, but uh, if nobody has anything else, we can kind of roll on to the last one. Okay. So this is a really, really good question. We've had multiple conversations about this off air. Um, I will pose this initially to Josh, and then we can kind of kick it around and go from there. Um, Josh, this person asks, when they started lifting, I quickly felt that I have a good understanding how to build strength and size. Uh, when friends asked me questions, I thought I could have a really solid answer for everything. Now, of course, the more I learn, I realize how much I don't actually know. Although I am a much better lifter than when I started, when I'm asked a question, I kind of get paralyzed and, and, and have something along the lines of, I don't know, pretty much for everything. No one knows for sure. There isn't enough evidence or it depends is kind of my answer. Um, these answers are honest, but they aren't necessarily helpful for someone who doesn't care about the science or whom lifting is in their career. Um, as a coach, how do you deal with answering clients' questions and providing them useful information when you aren't 100% sure of the answer? Yeah, this, this question is awesome. I think uh, a lot of us that are exposed to what we think is the right way to go about things in terms of critically thinking about things and, and critically appraising um, claims and, and ensuring there's evidence behind it, et cetera, is, is we realize the importance of that. And we can, we can really take that far and kind of get to a point of nihilism. Um, 
which I struggle with currently and have struggled with, and, and I, I'm sure you guys have too, <laughs> um, just in terms of like, how do you answer a question and like, okay, if, if, you know, you, you claim to be a quote unquote evidence-based practitioner, do you need a reference behind every single de programming decision you make or every single thing you say publicly? And I think the, the, the biggest thing is twofold is, is just aid scaling your confidence with the, the level of evidence to support it um, would, would probably be the first thing. Um, so if you're going to make a statement and there isn't strong evidence for it, try to make that clear, or at least don't act like it's evidence-based just because you're an evidence-based guy, right? It don't, don't cite things that aren't really relevant to that topic. Um, and just kind of try to differentiate what is truly based on a specific reference or references and what is kind of, okay, this is evidence led, right? Like my interpretation of the evidence as well as my practical experience leads me to this conclusion because I think that latter thing is, is so important, right? I think, um, when we first initially, um, kind of started to put stuff out online, we were like, man, we need to have a reference behind every single statement, which I think comes from a good place. But then we are like, man, we're just going to be of no help to anybody. So it's like, how can we also put out that evidence-based stuff? Oh, a, a new study came out, or we're going to review a study because we think this has important practical implications. But what if we have something that is, you know, okay, we've, we've understand the broad strokes of a, of an area of research, but we're looking to apply it. We don't necessarily have a one-to-one -one reference. Where do we go from there? I think that stuff is still really important to talk about. Like we we've talked about in this podcast, um, you know, why, um, you know, we think repeating training cycles and, and kind of using that as our unit of training is helpful. Is that evidence-based? Are there direct references for that? No, but like, I think it still is, is, might be helpful to some people. Um, so I think finding that balance of having humility with, with which you discuss things, but also not being paralyzed by the fact that, or, or not having the impression that you need to have a reference for every single thing you say. But the crux of it is that it's, you're not acting like something is evidence-based when it's not evidence-based. So when we were talking about repeating training cycles, we didn't throw out studies that were like, really stretches or whatever. So I guess the answer is you have to make things practical to actually be helpful and to be helpful to whoever's asking you questions or your loved ones or your friends or whatever. Um, but just kind of scale your answer according to, um, you know, the, the, the certainty of the evidence and kind of try to differentiate what is truly quote unquote evidence-based and what is more um, kind of a combination, combination of being evidence-led as well as um, experience-driven. Yeah, I'll just add a few points, uh, things I thought of. I think this question seemed like it was posed a little bit more towards like the general population. And I think especially in our kind of little niche of the world, um, the question we're often dealing with is, is this optimal versus is this effective? I think the latter, the, the confidence you can have to say certain things with is considerably, considerably higher. So I think that paralysis that you have from like, oh, I don't know, is, is this is this going to be totally evidence based opinion? Like, I think that could be severely diminished because by and large, it's not going to be a harmful recommendation to tell people certain things about lifting weights so long as they're, you know, they aren't, um, you know, doing something completely irresponsibly. But like, if they ask a certain question, it's most likely going to be effective, but is it optimal? That's a slightly different question that we often deal with. And that's where the citations come in. That's where the, you know, arguing the extreme minutia comes in and, and people have slightly different interpretations, but by and large, I think every single person in the evidence, evidence-based community is going to recognize that certain things are, are very likely helpful advice. And, you know, just getting people to lift weights or exercise in the first place is probably going to be along those lines. So I don't think that's something you need to have, um, as much a paralysis with. And if somebody's question that they're asking is, you know, something along those lines that you think is going to be helpful in establishing that behavior change, that's maybe when you can um, not play the evidence-based card nearly as hard and just, and just deal with what's helpful um, to, to that person. Um, but yeah, that, that was kind of my main point is just differentiating that question, I think is an important thing to to think about what the person's actually asking you so you can deliver an effective answer. But I totally agree with it, Josh. Um, scale your, scale your the confidence of your, your statement with the evidence available and just be really clear when you're just speaking based on your interpretation and that's totally fine. It can still be really, really helpful.
I think maybe to kind of wrap this up with an, with just a practical example would be like, you can, you can do both, right? You can be cautious and evidence-based, but still be helpful. Um, and I think that comes from two things. One is remembering, like you guys have said, it's evidence-based, not evidence only. And evidence, not, it's evidence-based, not science only, is maybe a better way to say it. Because practical experience is still evidence, right? Just maybe less confidence behind it. But I think that we, we can really, so, so here's an example, right? Say somebody comes up and says, how much volume should I do? Well, you can go into all the studies and X, Y, Z, but we're not sure, right? So you can get caught in that trap or you can just say, hey man, we're not really sure. It kind of depends on a lot of things. The studies aren't really clear, but logically we know if you feel obliterated all the time, you're doing too much. And if it never, if you're not making progress and you're doing a very little amount of volume, maybe do a little bit more, right? So you, you can still be cautious and be and have that intellectual integrity while still giving somebody a helpful answer. Just leaning into the logic a lot of times can really put you in, in the right place. I think the the way to wrap that up um, is just be be humble. Like that, be able to be proven wrong if you know presented with other evidence, but also just be humble in the statements that you're making to other people. And as long as it comes from a a good place and, and you're scaling your confidence to, to the evidence you're referencing, even if that is your own experience, it can be very, very helpful, especially when we differentiate between that question of, is it effective versus is it optimal? Um, yeah. But- and, and when you, when you have that, like, obviously definitely agree, Zach, like, hum- like definitely have that humility, but I also like something that I come back to oftentimes is like, you need to have discussion around the research in order to like further the field. So like, if you're if you have an opinion based on your understanding of the research, it is a net negative for, for the field if you're not being public about it or, or having discussions around it. Because if you think there's something that people are off the mark on, and you're not generating discussion around it. Yes, you want to be you, you want to always leave the door open for being proven wrong. But if yes, like the, the, the research is what it is, but we also need to practically apply it. And, and there's a step there, right? There's a step between the actual data presented in the study and applying it. And, and there's, there's interpretation in that gap there. And if, if you think there's, there's uh, misinterpretations or, or you have a slightly diff- different interpretation and you're not bringing that to the forefront and trying to generate discussion, again, while, while having the humility and being open to being wrong and, and trying to expose yourself and, and kind of prove yourself wrong but if you're not even like taking that step, then then your contribution to the field is is you know you have the ability to contribute to the field, and if if you're not doing that, then you're 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 going to fail to achieve that. So again, like there's a humility, but there's also like saying what you think or like presenting your interpretation because it is an interpretation, right? And 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 you have the ability um, to to come to a different practical conclusion, and and those discussions are huge, right? Like beyond just this, what the study says itself, perhaps more important is discussing it with your peers and, and you know, kind of picking up what other people um, learned from it and kind of coming to the, the best possible conclusion with the available evidence. And if just one person is doing that, you're going to be limited. So I just wanted to add that in there. Open and honest communication is the way to the golden gate, says Josh Pelland. Um, but yeah, without, uh, without further ado, guys, we'll wrap up this episode here. Um, Josh told me to make sure to tell you guys to do the five-star review thing. I think that's how it works. We're still, uh, you know, well, double digits. This is this podcast 10. We've been doing this thing for a little bit longer now, a little bit more experience. So hopefully the audio quality is a little bit better. We've been working hard on that. Um, but yeah, leave, uh, leave positive ratings and review on all the podcast platforms. And please make sure if you enjoyed the podcast, go ahead, share it on your Instagram stories. Give us a little bit more exposure if you guys are enjoying things hopefully you can continue to shape the show to help as many people as possible but thank you all for joining yet again and we will see you on the next episode